Hello and welcome to this episode of Pixel Sift. This is our 44th iteration and boy, are we racing up to our one year anniversary or what? Uh, I am joined in the studio today. <laughs> Thanks for that writing, James. Very, very classy there. Uh, I'm joined in the studio today by Mitch and Scott. Hey, hey. Hey. And over the airways, uh, trusting the gods of Skype, uh, we have Dr. Kate Rains Goldie, the director of uh, Games Interactive at FTI, and winner of the Wyatta Insight Achiever of the Year Award. Thank you for joining us, Kate. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Kate, you'll be giving us some insights into the future of WA Games development. Uh, but first up, our topics for this week, Mitch. Yeah, today we'll be talking internet-free gaming. What happens when you take the seemingly vital component of your gaming experience away? Uh, and our last topic today, we'll be touching on what we're calling pastiche or homage gaming. Games that borrow or at least heavily nod in the direction of a pre-existing game. That's coming up a little bit later. But right now, we have the shipping news with Brian Fairbanks. The 2016 Perth Games Festival is coming up. It's a wonderful experience full of video game demos, card and tabletop games, and even virtual reality. All of which are developed right here in WA, and all of which you can play and experience yourself. This is an incredible opportunity to get a taste of some culture produced in Western Australia. You can attend some seminars and panels for a further look into the WA gaming industry, and of course it is family friendly. It will be hosted at the Perth Town Hall on October 1st, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and the entry is free. The Interactive Games and Entertainment Association, the IGEA, and the Game Developers Association of Australia are currently conducting a survey on the local games industry to get a more accurate version of the size and scope of Australian games. This will assist in future advocacy and lobbying on behalf of the industry as well as any possible funding frameworks. So if you're involved in making games in any capacity, you're welcome to fill it out. You can find this survey link on our page, pixelsift.com.au slash IGEA survey. And to get right down to gaming itself, Hexus Smash 2 has just smashed its way onto the Google Play Store, and it's available for free. Hexus Smash 2 was developed by a team based in Mandra called Error 7 Dev. Aim and shoot the balls at the hexagonal targets using the dozens of awesome physics objects to clear a path or set up the perfect shot. See how many balls it takes you to smash all the targets. Destroy the blue hexagons to pass the level and the green hexagons to unlock bonus levels. Use your logical thinking skills to take advantage of the objects in each level. Portals, elevators, crates, bouncy blocks, launchers, and more. This is a free game by local WA people. Check it out. That was Western Australian Games and News, and thanks to John and Jess at letsmakegames.org. Check that out for some further WA Gaming news. Pixel Civ! It's not Pixel Civ, it's Pixel Sift. Pixel Civ! So this generation of gaming machines is led on the internet like no other. Even with other devices embracing the online mentality, such as fridges, TVs, and even light bulbs, <laughs> um, no other devices in our home really rely on the solar connection even to function at its basic level. Um, but what happens when this vital connection is taken away? I was surprised at how impotent the PS4 became when it did not have access to the internet last week. Now, this is all from last week when we were trying to get a little bit of a No Man's Sky preview. Absolutely. Uh, and it all kind of went wrong because we weren't prepared for the... It was silly of us, really, but we weren't prepared for the lack of internet on that particular particular machine. Yeah, so I, I thought I thought the PS4 we had here at the office was connected to the internet, but it wasn't. So I thought, all right, we'll just see how far I can get with this game. And it didn't even let me... Well, it, it <laughs> launched, and then it said, no, you need to update... The PS4 itself needed an update, and No Man's Sky itself needed an update. Now, I do understand that there is some debate of whether No Man's Sky is actually a, is an online game or not, and I, I think it absolutely is. So I guess I couldn't I couldn't really be faulted for expecting so much of it without the internet. But it seems there are some games that present themselves to be single player at least, but need the internet. Kate, you were telling us earlier that you were trying to load up Pokemon Go when it came out, and you were in an area that was you know, not within your normal internet connection range and uh, had a few issues. Yeah, it didn't really work at all. I was camping that weekend. So, um, yeah, it didn't work at all. I hear there's no Pokemon Go or no no Pokemon out there. Um, I couldn't even check, but I doubt that there are. I mean, it's, all the Pokestops are based on um, Ingress, which also requires 
phone service or the internet to work. And so if no one was doing stuff in that version, earlier version of Pokemon Go, I guess you could call it, then that would there would have been uh, content there anyway. So yeah, I also um, I also had uh, No Man's Sky and I played it as the update was downloading. And um, as soon as the update installed, um, about a day later, because it took a really long time to download because my internet connection crap sometimes, um, it actually broke the game. <laughs> and um, I had I had duplicates of all the planets, and it moved me to somewhere else. So all I had to restart after um, a good chunk of time going into it. So not having the internet at the beginning was, yeah, not a good situation. Oh, well, I think the internet almost ruined it. Yeah, from the sounds of things. Yes, it would have been better if I had not yeah. updated it at all. I think. Well, it's interesting you talk about like Pokemon Go was such a huge phenomenon for you know at least a couple of weeks. Everyone was talking about it, but you know think about how many of the population of of people in Australia who live outside of the metropolitan area who just couldn't experience that were just disconnected from this. I guess people would say it's a cultural phenomenon, really. It, it is interesting to note on this topic that in two thousand and 2013 when the xbox one was first being talked about at that e3 the backlash that microsoft got for suggesting even remotely that their console was going to need to be connected to the internet once every 24 hours i think and a lot of their games would require the internet as a staple and there was outcry xbox ps the playstation made fun of them um like the gaming community as a whole just stomped on it, it it's one of the reasons why the ps4 has vastly outsold it in this generation and yet here we are like the, ev mm. everything that we were f afraid of has happened and really it's not really that big a deal because the internet is available but it's just when it isn't suddenly our devices just become paperweights but the internet like over the, over the last couple of years especially has just become more readily available and faster and just and and, and just an expected kind of part of a lot of devices um, uh, you know, a lot of the games that were, pray, you know, are really kind of great in as offline games started in the kind of times when, yeah, you would pop a game in and you wouldn't need to do an update and you wouldn't need the internet. Um, I mean, we, we've got, we see the end of series, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the advanced series of all those games now, you know, uh, the Warcraft, the Fallouts, the Witches, you know, um, when they first started as games, it wasn't really necessary and it was kind of good and what set them apart. But now... All games run on the internet because it's readily available everywhere. Yeah, you would ship a game that was finished <laughs> rather yeah, than right? and adding install... it Because I mean, apparently the the patch so the patch was one point oh three for um for No Man's Sky, and apparently even though it was point oh three in the kind of change to it, it apparently fundamentally changed the gameplay, um, and that was why it screwed up my game that I'd started in the earlier version. So it it seems more like that would be more than 0.03 of a change. Um, but, you know, that you can't do that. If you, if no one has the internet, you actually have to ship a game that's finished. And I think a lot of the issues that people are having with No Man's Sky, I think, and also I think with Destiny as well, um, are that you can now ship a game and add in features down the road and have kind of this thing where people are going to get it and then, I guess, kind of expect that part of the game is going to be given to them later or at least the developers think that that's okay because well, yeah. that's that's what we're seeing increasingly happen but at the same time the games are getting more ambitious yeah you're right there's an, inc an increasing you know, kind of expectancy for like a day one patch a work in progress almost you, you yeah. know what we were safe from this a lot of ds games mm. like yeah. the nintendo ds when as recently like most ds games do not require an update that being said pokemon x and y i think needed a serious patch because saving in a particular city would break the game Hmm. Can you imagine if like red and blue had that? I guess out of it the gives gate? its advantages as well because you know yeah. in a situation before you know they they had to do funky things with Pokemon patches where they right. had like a, a berry glitch which caused an issue and they had to send uh, send it through some uh, interesting way in order to get you to update your game. But mm -hmm. you know previously if you had a game like Pokemon Red and it was broken fundamentally and it hadn't been tested to that point and something you just missed in in your Q and A, uh, your QA it just would be you'd have to recall it. So you know? were, were games polished to a higher standard back then or is it just a no country for all men problem where you think that it th was just the game the problems have always been there now we just can fix them i think the complexity is much higher now for right. for a game you know think of the people that made you know the original pokemon game i think there was about four people who made that 
and it's a huge game that was a massive thing and now the teams that are involved with that are, are, are massive so i think a lot more effort needs to be put into this offline games because they are important and there's a lot of people that and i'm not exactly one of them but i do understand and i do know them that play offline games purely because they're offline um i think peter moore uh the second in command at publisher ea said uh in relation to battlefield 3 that that's uh, telemetry tells them that at least 20 percent um just want to play offline connected yet offline which is still online as far as i'm concerned and as far as this topic debate goes well i wonder with this how many people are kind of missing out on these experiences um that we are all sharing in because if you live in an area that isn't accessible, you know, we say we live in Australia, but you know, there are other places around the world where, because if you don't have access to these particular bits of infrastructure, you're just going to miss out on some experience. And then, you know, maybe you can't go and then create the next big game because you didn't have these formative experiences part of it. So yeah, it's really interesting to to think about how, how much this is, but let's, uh, or 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 on the other side of that, hmm. it might actually cause you to be creative in a completely different way. Like you see in Cuba where, I think there's now starting to get it in very limited fashion, but because their access to technology has been so limited by the U S embargo, they've had to be super creative mm. in other ways. And you see the same thing in, in even in um, the African continent with um, um, the way that they're creating film there. Um, that's basically adapted to the, to the technology that they have where it's um, doing something completely different than, than the Western world, which is really interesting. Yeah. Very, so there's very kind of two sides to that. Yeah, I guess that's yeah. it. Yeah. Always two sides. That's right. Well, let's mm. jump into our next topic now. Watch episodes, Let's Plays and more at youtube.com forward slash pixelsiftau. So we're still joined by Dr. Kate Rains goldie who is the Director of Games and Interactive at FTI, recipient of this year's Wyatta Insight Achiever of the Year Award uh, for her work in fostering the game industry here in WA. Kate, thanks for sticking with us and congratulations on winning the award. Thank you. And what does an award like this kind of mean for you and what does it mean for the WA games industry? Well, it's it's a huge honour for me. I was so surprised when I won it, particularly just because, you know, I think anybody working in games in Australia, in particular WA, often feels like we don't get a lot of support. So it was really validating and just not just for, for my work, but also for for us um, as an industry, because having this kind of stamp of approval from um, this organization that's been around a while and is well respected um, and is working in the kind of tech and innovation space broadly, not just games, but broadly in that space um, to to put a nice stamp of approval is basically saying, you know, the games industry is important, it matters. Um, and so it's, it's really um, a great tool to help me to really continue to advocate more strongly for the games industry. And it really got, I think, um, took us to the next level in, in getting our, what we're doing um, into the, in front of people who are, are making some key decisions. Do you think this is the start of a bit of a, a sea change in some of the thinking of, of policymakers around WA towards the, the games industry? I hope so. I mean, even in the past, so I've been working on this now, like basically since I've moved here, I've been kind of advocating. <laughs> so about 10 years I've been advocating for this, but really hardcore in the past, maybe two and a half years. And in that period, we've seen stuff like Scott Ludlam and the Green Party um, He's, you know, advocating for WA games, but also Australian games. Um, the WA Labor, uh, Kate Douse, who's the deputy leader, is a big champion for the games industry. She, they've added in um, into their new ICT policy. So if they get elected the next election, um, having um, games included in that, that support, which wasn't there before. So it, we're already starting to see that change. And um, it's it's really, really good because it's something we should be supporting. It's it's such a no-brainer Um I know people who who've heard me hear me speak about this a few times know it's it's my my favorite thing is it's a hundred billion dollar industry globally, and it's bigger than Hollywood. And it's you know if you invest in supporting game makers, you're investing in jobs and revenue generation and innovation. And it's just it's so important and such a no brainer if we want to be um, diversifying away from the resource economy. Why do you think, uh, I guess, there was a bit of a, a pushback or a shyness to putting money into the games industry in WA when we have other states like Victoria, which are doing a fantastic job with um, Screen Victoria, putting a lot of money in. Uh, uh, Queensland as well has got a, a 
a small a part of a, a game's funding as they're part of their film body as well. Why do you think there has been this sort of avoidance of it? I think, yeah, I often wonder that. I think it's a, I think it's probably a cultural thing. Um, I think games, well, still globally, have still a bit of a reputation of being this thing that you know nerdy guys do in the basement. Even though fifty percent of gamers now are women, so it's something that everybody everybody's interested in. Everybody does. Um, but you still have that kind of, I guess, stigma, um, to varying degrees. And especially if you're an older, like, you know, if you're often the politicians are a bit, um, of an older generation than a lot of gamers, you know, a bit older. So gamers are kind of, I would say, you know, 35 and under, uh, people who've grown up with, um, with games. So if you're a little bit older than that, it's something you see your kids doing and maybe you don't take it as seriously. And so I think there's the stigma about, you know, not really understanding that, you know, that it's something that everybody's doing now, something that um, has this huge economic potential, but also just that um, video games are a violent, they're violent or they're a waste of time and not even seeing the, the artful side of it, not seeing that there's, it's, it's well beyond just things like Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty. There's so much more to it than that, especially with indie games. So I think it's just, it's just a matter of, of education. And so getting people, getting the decision makers in front of, whatever game and coming to play at Perth and um, virtual reality has been huge as a great educational tool, um, especially um, games like um, Stir Fires, Symphony of the Machine, which is completely, obviously has artistic merit, is not a violent video game, is something completely different. And when you get people putting that, that headset on and having that experience, it's, there's no way that you can see that this isn't something huge that we should be supporting. I spent a fair bit of time actually inside of uh, Symphony of the Machine and uh, it is a very interesting experience to kind of, I guess you can, it's hard to describe to people. Um, but Didn't you break it? I did break it. <laughs> I, I tried as hard as I could and I broke it as quickly as I could. And uh, yeah, I broke it pretty significantly, but they were, I was giving them a bit of feedback. So, um, yeah, no, that's what play a pro style about, right? Exactly. So when, it's, when it's serious business time, it doesn't break. You don't have to ship a patch. <laughs> we were talking a little bit earlier in the week about Play Out Perth and you kind of told me that it kind of grew from, from other events that you were kind of organising into what it is today. Could you tell people a little bit about what it is and, and, and what it sort of aims to do? Sure. So I, my, my background, I also um, run my own games consultancy called Games We Play. And I've been doing that for about 10 years. So basically creating games for social impact and games, games for education, often kind of experimental or games like Pokemon Go. Um, so pervasive games, mixed reality games. And there's a huge community globally of people working in that space. So, uh, maybe I shouldn't say huge, but I should say vibrant community. So vibrant community of people, um, it's pretty big in Europe, not so big in Australia, but basically people who are are sort of interested in, in pushing the boundaries and, and the artful experimental side of games and, and thinking beyond video games. So you have a bunch of different cities like New York or San Francisco or London, where you have meetups of people who get together to, to test these games. And because... Yeah unlike video games, there are, well, I would say unlike video games, but more than video games, they're heavily reliant on people in the physical world. So they, you have to test them. Otherwise you're going to be screwed if you just go and, you know, it, it, it's a video game you can kind of get away with. You're not going to get the best result, but um, it'll probably work and not break. But there's a high potential if you play a pervasive game that has not been tested at all, it will break and the, you're, yeah, it's the worst. So th these um, communities came out of that necessity. So I really wanted to start that here, both to encourage more people to work in this space, but just as like a resource for, for testing my games. And I started to get a lot of tabletop and video game designers coming along saying, we want to test our games. So I just, um, as I do, um, you know, like to iterate and respond to what the community needs and just evolved it into being a any kind of game, but imbued with that kind of um, community openness, um, diverse and um, creative space that's very much um, friendly and social, but also uh, an important resource for the game community. 
And very important when people, I guess, are networking with people in their local area, in their state as well, who are looking to kind of take from, you know, the bedroom game developer level to maybe starting a company like uh, WA Screen Award winning Black Lab Games or uh, I think uh, Stirfire as well won an Inside Award as well. Didn't they pick one? Up as well, yeah. They they they're going on to the the finals for the I Awards, which is the national. Yep. So they were going to be representing WA nationally for a Symphony of the Machine, which is amazing. Yeah, um, Kate, do you think what Australia needs is maybe a big AAA release to maybe get them get us on the map regarding games development? We did have some AAA studios a while back, and they all closed because of the global financial crisis. So I don't know if that. I mean, there's two schools of thought about that where, yes, maybe that's a good thing to have and we need that as a, as to, to kind of get the games industry kick-started. But I think that indie games are the future and smaller games are the future. I mean, even though, you know, No Man's Sky's got a, some flack for, for the game, that's a, an indie game studio that's basically released a AAA title. So I think that if we can actually get some bigger... so. Um, games like Cross the Road are an example of how indie studios can create games that actually bring uh, up huge. Um, that hipster whales now they're, they're, they have kind of they're not a AAA studio but they're now supporting other studios in Melbourne for example so if you have one studio that's, that's achieved a greater you know kind of greater success it can bring everybody else up so I think stuff like that doesn't necessarily have to be a AAA studio it just has to be a studio that's had some success because they can not only provide resources, um, you know, like financial support or investment in other smaller studios, they can also provide the, um, the mentoring and the knowledge to, to help. So the fact that they're in the arcade is probably a really great resource for the other studios that are there. Kate, we might just jump into our next topic, but we're going to hear a little bit about uh, the next play-up event at the end of the show. We'll find out for people who are in WA if they want to come along and play some of the, uh, the brand new games in Western Australia. Cool. Visit us on pixelsift.com.au. Recently, a game titled Pokemon Uranium was launched and then quickly removed from the internet. It was a new fan base generation of the globally successful franchise of Pokemon, but was sadly removed due to the increasing risk of legal issues. Our last topic today, we'll be looking at this brand of games, a brand that we're naming Pastiche or even Homage Gamings. Oh, are we naming that now? Yes, 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 we are. <laughs> Uh, so they're games that either borrow heavily or were directly inspired by other video games of a similar type. We were having a chat about this before and we were like, well, okay, we need to get this in our head. Homage is or, what they were intending to do yeah. uh, because they're doing a loving tribute to the games that they, they love. The other one we were talking about as well is the uh, AM2R, another Metroid 2 remake, um, but then end up being a pastiche because they end up ripping off the IP yeah, completely. I mean, it can be both. <laughs> Yeah, it can be both, yeah. and uh, I think uh, that's what these ones have kind of felt fallen afoul of. Um, there's an interesting sort of uh, question to be asked because in many other forms of, of media, we see this sort of remix and, and recreation culture where art forms are basically remade and into other different expressions. Um, but, you know, there is sort of this difficult land in which these games live because they are obviously using a lot of the assets of, a, of an intellectual property. But, you know, is that enough that it is changed it enough that it can be it stand on its own right? What about one of my favourite titles? Um, I've already forgotten the name of it. I had it in my head already. <laughs> Um, I mean, these. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll give I'll you a second to remember. I'll think about yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, these aren't don't always end up bad. The, um, the uh, another Metroid Two remake, as you said, and the Pokemon Uranium, as I said. There was also a Star Wars Battlefront Three um, fan made one that was um, scrapped pretty recently in the last month or They've so. They just. I think they're just ripping the Star Wars name off it and oh, changing a bunch of fantastic. things, so the that's, game itself is going to stay. But you know, maybe that's how see, it goes it on from a pastiche into an homage. Yeah, it's Freedom uh, Planet, by the way. Freedom nice. Planet, <laughs> just an homage to the Sonic, Sonic series but that, of games. That's one that is now on the marketplace. It's on, it's on the Wii U, and it's on. It seems to be on a lot of things. So some of them do get the blessings. Um, yeah. There was a uh, an, a Skywind modding project, uh, which is remaking Elder Scrolls Three um, with from the 2002 uh, graphics and engine up to the 2011 Skyrim uh, engine. Um, but there's also there's a, such a long list of copycats and fan made ones and whatever. 
Um, I've got a couple of good copycats that are not exactly kind of, um, you know, pastiche, but an homage in a way. Uh, Diddy Kong Racing. Oh. Uh, and obviously Mario Kart thing uh, by Rare. Kind of bringing it, bringing that kind of uh, bright... Kart um, racing sort of... Uh, fantastic. Yeah. Mortal Kombat. Yeah. Classic. What a... What about well, titles? I guess it depends when something becomes a genre. Well, uh, how did something? I feel like yeah. like yeah. game anyway. like Street Fighter really defined that, and Mortal Kombat kind of followed up with Midway. But Saints Row uh, was oh, another yeah. one. Skate, uh, Rock Band, yeah, and Forza. What about what about fan, transla- fan translations? Sorry, what was that? Yeah, Kate? fan translations as well. Yeah, yeah. Were... So like um, Earthbound, I think it was called originally called Mother, the one that never got released in North America. They did a fan translation of it a few years ago. And then eventually has now because it's become so popular. Actually, has been released onto the um, onto the Nintendo stores officially. Yeah, that, there you go. That's amazing. And yeah. you know that wouldn't exist unless people had gone out there and, and given this game to people. And, and it you took know. a really long time too. I remember when they were translating it. And there's a bunch of fan ones that don't get pulled up. Like they don't get either removed or or blessing. They just kind of get to live their merry life as they do. Um, there's a just to get on the Pokemon one, and there's plenty more to come. Actually, there's plenty of Pokemon fan base <laughs> ones, but one that I really liked was Pokemon Fusion Generation. And basically, it was just um, you know the scientists have gone mad in Pokemon World, and they were combining, you know, fusing all the Pokemon <coughs> together. So you actually had like you know uh, hybrid Pokemon's, which was amazing. You know, like three-headed bird po- Pikachu's. Fantastic. Nice. Um, I've together. always wanted that one. Doom RL, which was like a roguelike kind of one where you could upgrade your guns and your person and whatever. Uh, Mega Man, uh, Day in the Light of Limelight, uh, 1 and 2. That, that was an amazing one because the Mega Man wasn't even really in it. You basically played as all the bad guys, which was the best part of Mega Man, really. You know, which like, I think is exactly that sort of thing where, you know, you've taken an idea of, of something and you've kind of remixed it and changed yeah. it from a different perspective. Yes, you're using a, something that already exists, but you are exploring a new sort of story from that. Kate, what do you think about this this idea of people taking the things that they kind of love and and rebuilding it? And where does that kind of sit in in your thinking? Yeah, it's it's uh, interesting because um, I've done also as, as well as doing game design, um, a lot of internet research, and used to work as an internet researcher and lecturer at Curtin. And that kind of debate has has happened already with with um, social media and that idea of remix culture and mm. and the the copy left and copyright issues. Um, Especially in the states, where if you look at, um, for example, Disney or the the debate that's happened around Disney, where in the states they had copyright legislation that would allow for basically um, material would go into the public domain after um, the author's death plus a certain number of years. It was pretty reasonable. And what's happened is because of lobby from Disney and other companies to maintain ownership, um, they've extended those years after the author's death and just kept extending them, extending them to basically avoid having Mickey Mouse go into the public domain. Mm -hmm. And the thinking behind having that public domain is that that is how culture works, is is culture grows on culture and culture is inspired by culture, previous culture. And even if you look at Disney, Snow White or Cinderella, those are all stories that were public domain that they re- reused and remixed, but then they don't want to contribute back to the culture. So that process of what's happening with video games is exactly that process. And um, it's it's a shame that we don't have legislation that allows for basically the creation of culture because there's that loop between the creators and the consumers of content. And even we were talking earlier about Pokemon Go, a lot of the content came from from people playing that game from Ingress. So it's you know, the the big companies are happy to take content from from players and from consumers, but not really happy to give it back. Mm. Do you think we'll ever get to a point where people are able to kind of change these things, or do you think it's kind of because it's tacked to the the, the film and and television copyright laws that we probably won't get there in in a lot of uh, you know game developers kind of working lives. Well, it's, it's, I mean, there's been a a huge lobby, like, especially if you look at the people behind the Pirate Bay um, and the Pirate Party, um, big in Europe, to, to, to push for open culture. So there are a lot of people pushing towards having, um, you know, I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where everything's just completely, you know, Creative Commons license where no one owns anything. But I think that there are people working in that space to push for that, um, for that change. But it is difficult because, you know, it is, it is people... You, you are fighting against companies like Disney that have billions of dollars um, who, you know, it's kind of hard to fight. It's a David and Goliath situation. So um, 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's going to change anytime soon. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's. I think there's other. I think also people are concerned. There's so many, so many other issues to be worried about. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm. Well, unfortunately, it's important. Of, but yeah, unfortunately, like you said, with the uh, bigger kind of studios and and just companies in general, uh, it's all about the money and the profits. And, and there's and other things can you know. And it's also interesting as well with free trade agreements that we have with other <laughs> countries as well. You know, Australians who are out there who may have a law locally that is uh, allowing them to do something with, with uh, culture um, may not be able to exercise that right because we've signed a free trade agreement with a country that has pushed their, uh, you know, public domain laws out to 75 plus years of after the person's death. So, you know, I guess we'll see what happens. I guess you, you kind of can't stop people from doing it. You can kind of only, uh, you know ask for permission and for uh, don't ask for permission but ask for forgiveness i guess and see how you go from there kate uh that's all we've got i, time. I feel like oh, sorry one last thing is yeah, i feel go like for indie it. developers yep. might be a little bit more forgiving so maybe you know again shout out to indie developers being the way to go rather than triple a creative commons yeah all of our stuff yeah. is actually creative commons i made sure that when we put it on there it's under a share alike license so yeah i made a go. creative commons game too so yeah. there you go there we go <laughs> Kate, that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today on this episode. It's uh, It's been very fascinating, and people now can go check out the next play up, which is coming up very soon if they're in WA. Uh, what are some of the details of that one? So that's a week tomorrow. It's uh, September 2nd, and it's going to be at the Nostalgia Box, which is our new venue for Play Up Perth. Um, that's on Aberdeen Street in Northbridge, and it starts at 6 o'clock and goes to probably about 11 and it's 10 bucks. You can get tickets online at playatperth.com or at the door. And we have, I think, about eight games at this point, a bunch of tabletop video games and one or two VR games, which is pretty exciting. Very fun to te test out the, the newest stuff that's kind of happening. Are we going, Joey? I think we might. We'll, we'll pop down there. Okay. I always tend to be down there. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you again for listening to the show. Uh, this is Pixel Sift. My name is Gianni. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. As usual, we'll be putting links up to everything on the website, including Pay Up Perth, uh, the first one at the Nostalgia Box. That website is www.pixelsift.com.au. And while you're on your website, you can do what Mitch Perry did this week, uh, and you can send us an email. Now, Mitch was listening to episode 42 and when we were talking about retro console hardware and he shared with us some of the, the mini arcade uh, cabinet that he's been building based on a Raspberry Pi with custom arcade sticks and buttons. So you can check out his handiwork at pretty cool. Mitch Perry Arcade Build, all one word. So Mitch Perry Arcade Build Thank you for getting in touch, Mitch. We love uh, hearing from our listeners. Scott. Yes. <laughs> Social media. I, I know the deal. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> listeners, you can catch us at facebook.com forward slash pixel sift, twitter.com forward slash pixel sift, twitch.tv forward slash pixel sift, and youtube.com forward slash pixel sift au. And Mitch, are all their episodes, where would they be located? Yeah, they're all available. Under Creative Commons license. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, they're all, so you can make a remix of this anyway. Um, on our one on website, uh, subscribe to our podcast on either iTunes, Pocket Cast, or using the RSS link on the page. And if you're there on any of the, the big platforms, give us a rating or review. But, uh, Kate, thanks for joining us, and we'll catch everyone again next week. Bye-bye. Thanks See for having you. me. Bye. Bye.